So today we're beginning a, a new Lenten series, uh, Life in the Minor Key, as we take a pause, a musical pause, and to reflect today. Um, and I'm, I'm becoming more and more a fan of the NRSV, the New Revised Standard Version, which is what our pew Bibles and most of our readings are from. Um, I first got introduced to this version in, in seminary, and uh, the more I read it, the more I like it. And so, a lot of times, if you have a King James, uh, it's translated as blessed here. Um, Sort of like the Beatitudes, blessed are the peacemakers. But uh, the translation that's probably closer is the word happy. Happy are those, and that's kind of what our theme is today. But happy is in a mood, it's not a mood that we we usually think about in the season of Lent, is it? Uh, Jesus on his Sermon on the Mount, when he talked about being happy or blessed or happy are those who mourn and those things. He didn't really mean happy, did he? Not as we think of it. Um, we usually translate it, as I say, the word blessed. Uh, in the case of the psalm today, it, the word relieved might be a little better that the psalmist is uh, talking about. And uh, there's some debate about the category for Psalm 32. Is it a uh, wisdom psalm, as some, some refer to it as? Uh, is, uh, some say, no, it's a, it's a penitent psalm, it's a confessional psalm, because uh, he's confessing his sins. And other scholars will say, well, that's not it, because he's not confessing any specific sin. Uh, this is kind of things we sit around in seminary and debate that most people don't care. Most people say, it's a psalm, okay? What does it matter? Uh, and, and maybe it doesn't matter a whole lot, but sometimes by wrestling with the text a little bit, you can, you can get a blessing from it. And you can find out, you know, what is he talking about here? And why is he writing this? What is the point of it all? And so, what if the meaning really is happy? What if he's saying there that we can be happy? And uh, if we go back to the psalm, Psalm 32, happy are those whose transgression is forgiven, and happy are those whom the Lord imputes no iniquity. And so, happiness, uh, first of all, according to the psalmist here, comes from really uh, reconciliation with God and living with a clear conscience. As I was talking about this morning with, with uh, sometimes just feeling like everything is tucked inside. But happiness is giving that to God. There's people today who spend thousands and thousands of dollars on therapy and all that, and I'm not against that. I, I've been to counselors myself, and I advocated. I'm not saying that you shouldn't. But my point is that there's a lot of people out there today that are miserable, and all they need to do is confess and have somebody to talk to about that. And as I read this psalm, I'm thinking about the person who wrote it, uh, as David is talking about his uh, self in this. And you know, it's a miserable soul who does not deal with their sins, uh, and it can cause a lot of misery. And David says in verse 3, and this should be on the screen for you here, a few of these, While I kept silence, my body wasted away through groaning all the day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me, and my strength was dried up as by the heat of the summer. And so you may recall David, uh, kind of what he's talking about here, uh, he had sinned, and basically he had uh, <clears throat> taken Uriah to be his wife, who was the wife, uh, Uriah's wife. He took Bathsheba to be his wife, and basically had her husband murdered. Talk about abuse of power here. And he did all these things and then tried to kind of cover it up and conceal it as if it didn't happen. Well, one day David is he's kind of talking to a prophet, Nathan, and he's kind of confronted with, with Nathan. And Nathan says in verse 6, because he has done this thing and has shown no pity. This on the screen too, I believe. Yes. He has done no pity. He must pay for the lamb four times over. See what had happened. 
Nathan gave an illustration of a poor man who had some guests that he needed to feed, and he didn't have anything to feed, so he went and took, a, or a rich man, he went and took a poor man's lamb in order to feed his guests. And David said, whoever's done this thing should not have any pity, but he must pay for the lamb four times over. Not realizing that the illustration was about him and what he had done. Then Nathan said to him those famous words, Thou art the man. Thou art the man. Say that with me. Thou art the man. That is a, the words that must have resonated with David, and must he must have felt that like a weight, like uh, you know somebody is screaming. But it was a simple message about his own problem and his his own sin. Thou art the man. And so uh, it's interesting that David was talking about other people and pointing the fingers at other people and how they should be paying for their sins when he was the one guilty of it all alone. And you know, I think sometimes uh, it's very easy for us to point our fingers at everyone else and point out their sins because somehow it makes us feel better about ourselves maybe. But God never called me or you to be the junior Holy Spirit to point everybody's sins out. And uh, that's why Jesus said uh, in, uh, in the gospel there when he's talking about uh, this very thing. Why do you seek, see the speck in your neighbor's eye? But do not notice the log in your own eye. And, you know, the whole point of it is, you know, it's so easy for us to look at other people and point out their faults without ever seeing our faults. And maybe it's because we, we don't take enough time to, to reflect and to think about our own lives. And that's part of what Lent is all about. As we begin to reflect, it's not about looking out at other people and trying to point out their problems. But looking back at our own selves and saying, hey, I'm a sinner in need of God's grace. When Jesus told His disciples they were going to betray Him, they all came with the question, Is it I, Lord? Is it I? And maybe that's the question we ought to ask ourselves once in a while and in this season of Lent. Is it I, Lord? Some of you may have seen the controversial clip. Uh, John MacArthur is a leading author uh, who has wrote a lot of books. He's a famous preacher and also uh, uh, author of the MacArthur Study Bible. But a, vir a, a, a video went viral not too long ago when he was asked about the popular speaker and author Beth Moore. Beth Moore is a, a person who uh, does a lot of uh, uh, retreats and uh, has a lot of places women go to hear her speak. And she's wrote a lot of books and she has some very good Bible studies out there. But when they asked uh, John MacArthur what he thought about Beth Moore, he declared that she should just go home. And he, in this, he's kind of citing the dangers of women preachers. He's a, he's a Baptist minister uh, and all of that. And I'm afraid that his take on this, his disdain in the name of sound doctrine, undermined any gospel message that he may have had. Maybe even worse than that was the response from the audience as they began to praise him for being so mean-spirited. And I, I have to think that, uh, that all this Christian infighting and all the people that are pointing out the sins of everybody else seems to be having a negative effect on the church today. Because, my friend, as I said, we're all sinners. We're all sinners. And uh, my point is never that, we, that people should not be accountable for their sins, but that it is not my job to figure out your problem. It's not my job to point out your sins. The thing is, none of us walked in here this morning with halos on. None of us are perfect. I, uh, you've heard me quote before the, uh, the quote from, several quotes from the Wounded Healer. One of my favorite authors is Henry Nowen. He's a priest and an author. And this is what he says about the Wounded Healer. 
He said, nobody escapes being wounded. We are all wounded people, whether physically, emotionally, mentally, or spiritually. The main question is not, how can we hide our wounds so that we don't have to be embarrassed? But how can we put our wounded, woundedness into the service of others? When our wounds cease to be a source of shame and become a source of healing, we have become wounded healers. Henry now. And so that is the place that David had to get to. He had to get to the place where his wounds would become not a source of shame so much, but as a source of healing for himself and for others. And so one of the reasons I don't try to, uh, to correct everybody else is simply because I've got a full-time job taking care of my own self. And I, that's not my responsibility anyway. It's interesting to me that in the Bible that the people that Jesus got the, the maddest with, the most angry with, were not the sinners. He had a Mary Magdalene come and wash his feet and bathe them with her hair. And she was, by tradition, thought to be a prostitute. And I'm sure it must have been a scandal. But he said, Leave, let her alone. And the sinners he loved and he, he was very kind to. But it was the self-righteous people, like the man who stood and said, Lord, I thank you that I'm not like this guy right here. I thank you that I'm better than, the, than him. Those were the kind of people that Jesus became angry with. And so today all I'm saying is that we need to uh, get to a place where we can allow our wounds and see our own self and reflect on our own selves. And take care of that because we're all in the same boat. We have here in the psalm a picture of a, of a sick and a depressed person. He would be uh, today diagnosed with uh, at least depression. When you read his words of how he's feeling and what's going on inside of him emotionally. And David's going through a tough time because he's, he's experienced all these things. And that's why it's important for us to be able to be transparent and to be honest and to be able to share our hearts with one another. John Wesley knew this when he set up small group, group meetings called Holy Clubs where people would be transparent and honest about themselves and talk about it. It was not a time to point out the problems of others, but talk about what they were experiencing and how they were failing and how they were doing good things. Recently, I was called to visit a lady. And uh, when I come in, she was crying. And she had some physical problems, of course, going on. But that was, at that point, the least of her worries. Sometimes people in the hospital, their physical problems are there, but that's not always the main thing with them. Studies show that people are just as, uh, many people, when given a survey, are as, are as concerned about their spiritual needs being addressed than their physical needs. And so as I walk in the room and I begin to talk to her, she said, she began to cry and she said to me, I don't feel worthy. I don't feel like I'm worthy of God's love. And I don't remember what I said exactly, but it was something like, well, join the club because we're not worthy. And that's why it's God's grace. And I used this example before, and you've heard me probably use it here, but I talked about her daughter was sitting on the bed. And her daughter was helping her, and I said, you know, do you love your daughter? And hoping she would say yes. And she said yes. I said, well, has she ever done anything that maybe you didn't like, something that bothered you, that you didn't approve of? And she said, well, yes. And her daughter saying yes. And I said, did you still love her? Well, of course. Well, God loves you much more than that. And God is not going to turn you away just because you're not perfect. And, you know, I didn't think about it at the time, but I was thinking about the fact that if someone you knew, maybe even an enemy, but definitely someone that you knew, were uh, falling through ice, and they had fallen, the ice broke, and they fell, and you were standing on the edge, and they would reach out their hand for you, would you not reach down and pick them up? God is so much more loving than you and I could ever be.
that anyone who would ever reach up to him and say, forgive me, he will do it. He will do it. And the thing is that when God forgives, man, it's complete forgiveness. He doesn't bring it back up again. It's gone if we can just let God do that. But God will reach down His hand. I like that old song, when He reached down His hand for me. When He reached way down for me, I was lost and undone. Without God or His Son. And He reached down His hand for me. Well, in one of the songs, it kind of felt the same thing. And I got that picture of someone falling in, in the waters and the ice. And confession is really reaching up to God. And I, I want to put up a, uh, a Bible verse here that's from, uh, I think, the message version. It says, the secret sources of ocean are exposed. This is the writer experiencing this in Psalms. The hidden depths of earth lie uncovered. The moment you roar in protest, let loose your hurricane anger. But me he caught, reached all the way from sky to sea. He pulled me out of that ocean of hate, that enemy chaos, the void in which I was drowning. They hit me when I was down, but God stuck by me. He stood me up on a wide open field, and I stood there saved, surprised to be loved. Have you ever been surprised to be loved? It was the prodigal son who said, I'm not worthy of God's love. And I'll just go back as a hired servant. And he may not take me back as his son anymore, but at least he'll take me back as one of his slaves. I'll work and I'll, I'll live in the slave quarters and I'll bring him bread and I'll do all those things. But it was the father who ran and he grabbed him and he kissed him. And he said, this is my son who was lost and now he's alive again. He was gone and now he's here with me me. Let's bring on the fatted calf and let's celebrate because my son has come home. Don't you ever think, don't you ever think that God doesn't love you or that God is through with you. Understand that God is waiting for you all the time. That all he wants you to do is come home. Just come home. And I believe that he will be waiting for you with open arms, wide open arms. He promised he'd never turn you away. You know, it's true that the season of Lent is a time of reflection. It's a time of fasting. It's a time of confession of sin. But nowhere does it say that we have to walk around depressed with a sad look on our face. Nowhere does it say that we can't be happy people even in the season of Lent. Because we're sinners in need of a Savior. And there is a bomb in Gilead. There is forgiveness available for all those who ask. And I promise you that if you come to Him, He won't turn you away today if you'll just come to Him. As we think about the blessings that God gives us, think about this. That happy are those whose transgression is forgiveness. And because of that today, we can come to God's table and receive from God. This is the Lord's table. And God doesn't turn us away because we're sinners, because we're all sinners. And so we want to invite you today as we think about that. The Lord Jesus, on the night in which He was betrayed, He took bread and He broke it. And He said, this is my body given for you. Do this as often as you do it in remembrance of me. And after the same manner, he took the cup and he blessed it. And he said, this is my blood which is shed for you. Do this as often as you do it in remembrance of me. And so we practice what is known as open communion here. You do not have to be a member of our church and you don't have to be perfect to be able to partake of communion with us here today. Just come with a humble heart today, acknowledging your sins before God. That's all we ask. So we're going to ask a musician to come or somebody to come up and just play a little bit while we're, we're doing communion. And we invite you to come. Let's, uh, let's go to the Lord in, in prayer uh, before we uh, partake. Dear Father, as we come before you, we want to ask you to forgive us of our sins. And we pray for these elements here, God, that you would bless them today. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we might be the body of Christ to the world. 
God, as we begin to lead a new life, free us for joyful obedience. With you we pray. In Christ's name, amen. Amen.